afternoon and welcome to this quarterly meeting of the HPC's Advisory Council. Welcome everyone, happy fall. Uh, I'm David Seltz, the HPC Executive Director. Really pleased to uh, be here all together virtually um, to have a great meeting. We have so much to update you on and so much to discuss with you and so much to get your input on. Um, so it is really just, as always, as always, these meetings are just uh, really full of great content and looking forward to hearing from all of you. Um, but first, I want to welcome and acknowledge uh, a new person to the Health Policy Commission. Um, Deb DeVoe is our new HPC chair of the board. Um, I think as many of you know, the inaugural chair of the Health Policy Commission Stuart H. Altman, uh, who was uh, with the HPC since the very beginning, uh, the first chair appointed by Governor Deval Patrick, stepped down from his role after um, 10 incredible years leading the HPC board and contributing so much to state health policy here in Massachusetts and specifically to our cost containment efforts. Um, Stuart was um, beyond in his term and had uh, stayed on a little bit longer to help lead the organization, especially through some of um, the challenges of the last uh, two and a half years, uh, but did feel it was time to uh, step away from the, his position and to provide an opportunity for Governor Baker to appoint a new chair. And we are so pleased uh, that Governor Baker uh, decided to appoint and that Deb agreed uh, to serve uh, as our new uh, chair. Uh, so before we dive into any more content of the meeting, I do want to just uh, open, turn this over to Deb uh, to have her introduce herself um, and her background. Thank you so much, David. And hello, everyone. I'm delighted to um, join the Advisory Council meeting today and look forward to the discussion. For those of you that I haven't worked with, um, I come to the Health Policy Commission from a career working in healthcare in Massachusetts, both at uh, health plan and provider organizations. Most recently from Beth Israel Leahy Health for the last uh, three and a half years. And then prior to that at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts for 18 years. So I think I've crossed paths with many of you, but look forward to uh, working with those who I'm just getting to know now uh, on the call today. And I am delighted to be part of the Health Policy Commission. We've had a busy couple of months since I joined and um, we're looking forward to, as David said, talking with you all about, about those activities. Thank you. Thank you, Chair DeVoe, um, and welcome. And I will, I will just testify that uh, Chair DeVoe has truly uh, <laughs> dove into the deep end of, of the Health Policy Commission and all of our work. And she noted that we've had a busy uh, summer, uh, some of which we'll talk about um, today, uh, but just want to um, just want to share how grateful we are for her uh, deep engagement in this work. It, this is, you know, board members are, are typically, you know, unpaid positions at the Health Policy Commission, uh, but Chair DeVoe is truly treating this as a full-time job, um, and we are so grateful for her um, willingness to do so. Um, so on the slide here, we have uh, the makeup of the Advisory Council. I do, do know we have a couple of designees today, which is great. Um, I think my one ask for today's meeting, uh, as we are going to be joined by Chair DeVoe for the uh, remainder of the meeting, is that when you do um, provide comments or ask questions, that you might introduce yourself and your organization, just so that she can um, get a better understanding of who everyone is on this very esteemed uh, group. I know she knows many of you, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll try to keep to uh, uh, introductions when we, when we speak up. Um, and with that, I think we can um, dive right in. So the main um, agenda here today is we will first provide an executive director's report um, between myself, uh, Colleen Nelsonmeyer, the deputy executive director, and Lois Johnson, the general counsel at the HPC, 
just with some updates of activities um, of the HPC over the last few months since our last uh, advisory council meeting. Um, and then we will turn into the main agenda item for today, which is to uh, review some key findings from our recently released and approved 2022 healthcare cost trends report. Um, and we'll review the policy recommendations that are included within that um, report. I, I will give, you know, kind of a summary overview of those recommendations, but really reserve most of the time today in our discussion for your perspectives on these recommendations, um, your perspectives on, on where um, the Commonwealth uh, needs to go um, and to evolve our approach to advance affordability, to advance cost containment, and to advance health equity, and identify opportunities that we can work together to uh, advance these policies and these solutions. Uh, so that will be the main bulk of the discussion today. Uh, so diving right into the executive director's report, first did want to um, review with the advisory council that uh, the HPC um, just last week approved our first performance improvement plan. Uh, the performance improvement plan process is a, a critical uh, aspect of Chapter 224 and the Commonwealth's cost containment strategy. It really is the primary accountability tool um, by which um, the HPC can hold uh, individual health plans and health systems uh, accountable to spending above the benchmark. And so uh, back in January, the board uh, did vote to require our first performance improvement plan um, from Mass General Brigham. Um, and subsequent uh, to that requirement and an initial filing of MGB uh, in May, uh, there was uh, a tremendous amount of, of ongoing consultation uh, between HPC and MGB um, MGB ultimately submitted a revised performance improvement plan on September 20th, uh, which was then approved by the HPC board unanimously uh, last week. So this slide just provides uh, some summary of that uh, performance improvement plan. It is projected by MGB to save uh, about $128 million annually, um, and it is an 18-month uh, performance improvement plan uh, from October 1st. Uh, to March 31st of 2020, um, In terms of some next steps here, uh, we do expect to work closely with MGB throughout the implementation timeline to uh, understand uh, how these strategies are being implemented and the impacts of these strategies, um, and do expect to receive periodic reporting from MGB um, throughout uh, the implementation time period uh, and a reasonable period thereafter. Um, the HPC board at the end of the day uh, must determine whether the performance improvement plan was successful. Um, so we'll need the data and evidence information working with MGB uh, to evaluate uh, the final results of the performance improvement plan. And there's some um, process options laid out on the bottom half of the left hand side of the slide um, to close out the performance improvement plan process. On the right, you can see the strategies that MGB is proposing. I think uh, notably, and one of the areas that we had identified uh, as a driver of spending was price. And so a majority of their strategies, um, even, even more than a majority, um, are um, in the category of, of price reductions and actions. Um, so uh, while this has been uh, kind of uh, feels like a long time to get to this stage of, of having an approved plan. In reality, the work is just beginning. Uh, the work is just beginning with MGB to implement this plan and for the HPC to monitor and evaluate the implementation of this plan over the next 18 months. So I would expect that you will hear from um, me again at future advisory council meetings, just providing process updates uh, along the way on this important uh, activity. Um, I will now turn it over to Lois to give some legislative updates, and we will, uh, at the end of this section, we will pause and, and take questions and comments on all of these topics, because uh, there's a, a lot here in this executive director's report. So Lois, uh, we got some new work from the legislature this year. Tell us about it. Yes, we, we certainly did. And um, 
Great to be here with you all this afternoon. And I'm here to give you a little bit of a preview of some, a slate of new responsibilities for the Health Policy Commission, both in this year's budget and in the new mental health law. So the budget um, includes a number of areas where the HPC needs to consult with other agencies on studies and commissions. And I'm just gonna highlight two areas where the HPC has a lead role. First, the law directs the HPC to study and report on behavioral health related boarding and the ongoing effects of the pandemic on boarding in acute settings. And that includes not just ED, but med surge and observation. Um, that report's due next July. Second, the HPC must study and issue a report on the new community behavioral health crisis system, the behavioral health access line and crisis intervention services that are required in the budget and for which a trust fund and a funding mechanism was established. This report um, is intended to evaluate and make recommendations of that new effort and is not due until January 2025. So that's something um, have, once this uh, program rolls out, the HPC is required to evaluate it and make recommendations on sustained funding. So next slide. Uh, the new ABC Act, the comprehensive mental health law signed into law in August, also includes a number of new mandates for the HPC. And in particular, the law requires the HPC to produce two new reports, one on behavioral health managers with the Division of Insurance, um, studying their impact on quality and access to behavioral health care services in the Commonwealth. And the second is a report on pediatric behavioral health planning. That first report is not due until May of 2024 um, and is required to be updated every three years thereafter. The law also requires the HPC to do some regulatory development um, in two areas. So first, the law amends the insurance consumer, consumer protection statute that OPP administers. So OPP will update its regulation regarding the carrier internal grievance process and external review process that OPP manages to align with those changes. And second, this is a new, uh, this is a new responsibility. The law requires the HPC to convene um, an advisory council to develop uh, recommendations um, and then develop a standard consent form for the exchange of confidential mental health and substance use disorder treatment information. So, and also issue a, a, a regulation regarding the use of that information. So I'll, I'll note that many uh, members of this council may also um, be serving on that advisory council. And so uh, please look for outreach from us um, on this topic. And of course, welcome your feedback on that, um, as well as all of these areas of future HPC study. So having outlined some new work to come, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Colleen to talk about some of the work we've already completed. Thank you, Lois. And right back to you because Colin does have a question. Colin? Um, thank you so much, Colleen. Uh, actually, less a, a question than a recommendation. Um, for that advisory group, I mean, I think while likely we'd be interested, the one group I would urge you to reach out to is Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee. Um, they're the subject matter experts on this and they've done a lot of work on concerns about you know, who behavioral health information gets shared with under what circumstances and the consequences of that. That's certainly helpful. Thanks, Colin. No problem. All right, great. Um, hello to our advisory council members. Just a few updates for you today on our research agenda and a major upcoming event on this first slide here. If this isn't in case you missed it. Uh, last month, we issued perhaps our longest data points to date. This is our HPC data points, our blog series. This is a two-part feature on trends in urgent care centers in retail clinics. Some of you have been on this council since we first published this data way back in August of 2018. And this updated issue is it provides an update and a refresh of a lot of that information. So updating the data on the landscape of urgent care centers and retail clinics in Massachusetts, identifying the number of sites, location by region, locate, um, community income level, services provided, hours are open, record system they use, so a ton of important information. 
And then the part two is a deeper dive into the shift that we've seen recently of care delivery to these settings and in, with an examination also of out of pocket and overall spending. So um, we've heard feedback that this um, transparency effort has been incredibly useful. So we'll, we'll continue to make sure this is up to date and urge you to check it out on our website if you haven't already. On the next slide, I have two slides of upcoming uh, research publications. Um, we have a number of research and studies in the works right now, which is not surprising to you all. Um, I'll highlight a few here, which we think will be of interest to you. In fact, a lot of this upcoming work will be directly responsive to some of the discussion during the meeting today, I think, on policy recommendations. So uh, first we have here is a legislatively mandated report looking at the utilization of telehealth in the Commonwealth. Um, this will be assessing the impact it's had on patient access providing and providing some tangible policy recommendations. We'll actually be previewing this work at an upcoming public meeting and going to be releasing it early next year, so early 2023. The next item on this slide, hard at work, the team is on a report examining healthcare workforce, specifically the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on workers, wages, and education. Um, we'll be highlighting methods for retention to alleviate shortages that so many healthcare providers have felt in the, in the last two years. Um, and of course, many of you already know about this because you've worked with us on it already. And so we really appreciate how many of you have met with our team or connected with us or connected members of your network with us as we work through our qualitative, qualitative analysis for this study and, and collect stakeholder feedback. This one, we're going to be sharing findings also at the start of the new year. Um, a preview of findings in early 2023, and then we'll be releasing the report shortly thereafter. Um, last on this slide, the state budget this year included a provision actually directing us to analyze and issue a report on the ongoing effects of COVID on BH, on behavioral health related uh, boarding in acute hospital settings. So this work is gonna expand on research we've actually already done on this topic, which we most recently presented in an April, April board meeting, and we'll be sharing some of these findings at the end of this year, and the work will officially be released later in, in 2023. Um, also on the next slide here, some new research. This will be the first time you're hearing about this. We are conducting research into the commercial um, ambulance space, ambulance use in payments in Massachusetts. This is in the pipeline. This will have a fo uh, focus on payment variation in the Commonwealth. This is a project we've been grateful to be working on with EOHHS through their office of, of EMS at DPH. They've been consulting with us on this, and we will be sharing findings by the end of this calendar year. So very exciting on that. Finally, I'm just going to mention um, a major piece of work here, a component of the legislature's COVID relief bill. Um, HPC was directed to complete a study on health system factors um, and the impact they have in creating health disparities. Um, this work has been ongoing as the pandemic continues, evaluates all the various factors like provider supply, financing policies, et cetera, um, that have been exacerbating inequitable health outcomes. So we will be sharing this. This is a major study by us that we'll be sharing this at the start of, of the new year. Really looking forward to it. Um, so a lot there. A uh, lot to look forward to. And then on the next slide, we have... Actually, let me just let me just pause there if there if there are questions on upcoming publications. Uh, Donna, you want to go first? Thank you, Colleen. Uh, with regard to the study on ambulance services, as you're looking at other states, would you be also inquiring about the range of functions those ambulance services provide? For example, to what destinations besides hospitals? Do they deliver people? Uh, that's a question I know some of us in Massachusetts are interested in. Great. Uh, as we rethink crisis and emergency services, and I have a personal interest related to co-chairing the Restoration Center Commission. So I just, I'm just curious if that's part of the scope. Absolutely, David Auerbach, can you take that? Yes, actually, that that is a great question, and we do we do have a have some information in a slide on that currently as to the different destinations. It's a great question. Thanks so much, Donna. And Ellen. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Ellen LaPointe from Fenway Health. And I understand, and I don't have specifics in front of me, but some of the uh, reimbursement provisions uh, for telehealth are set to expire at the end of December. 
and it is to our knowledge they have not been uh those 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 expiration dates have not been extended at this point i know there's some advocacy underway and i'm just curious as to the plan timing of this report um you i think you said it's going to it's actually scheduled to come out after the first of the year is that correct yes that's right but right. we're going to do a we're going to do a major preview of it in our policy recommendations this year. So what the report will be released later. Uh huh. So I guess the question I have for you is when would we have access to that data for advocacy purposes? I can get back to you on that specifically. Okay. We'll Thank out you. Exactly when we release it. Great. All right, David Mattiotto. Hi, it's David Mattiotto from the Mass Association of Behavioral Health Systems. Welcome, Deborah. Um, so I just wanted to comment to kind of a little bit like Donna Marsh's comment on the uh, ambulance services. Just want to make sure you, you all are looking at um, even getting people from one hospital to another. Uh, for example, an emergency room that uh, has to transfer a patient to a psychiatric patient to another facility. It's taking hours and hours and hours to get someone from one point, point A to point B uh, here in Massachusetts, and it's impacting the emergency uh, room boarding as well. So I just want to point that out. It sometimes might be under the radar screen. The ambulance companies are so overwhelmed that people might wait in an emergency room, even though they've been accepted uh, for a transfer to another facility. So hopefully you can look at that. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much, we will. Thanks, David. All right, any other questions on upcoming research or research agenda? Liz. I saw you. Good morning, Liz O'Gilvie, Springfield Food Policy Council and statewide on food system uh stop i'm pretty excited about the role of health system factors and health disparities and i think that you'll find that lots of us who are on the ground particularly living in counties like hamden county that's ranked last as it relates to health disparities will be excited by this and it will offer us an opportunity to engage in advocacy with and um with with in a partner way and with and a let us help lift this up for you way for our healthcare partners. So I hope that is widely dispersed and perhaps the data presented in ways that those of us not historically engaged in this arena will be able to um, understand because I'm quite lucky in that Bay State and Mercy are really, Trinity Health Systems are really accessible to me and explain lots of things and I'm always trying to figure out how do we advocate for our partners. I'm just back from the White House Conference on Hunger and Nutrition. I was really excited to hear them talk about food as medicine and encourage those of us working in food advocacy and food access to really partner better with our healthcare providers. And so any information that we get to help understand those factors we can be good partners in coming up with solutions perhaps, or at least mitigators. Absolutely, thank you so much. That's incredibly important. We will absolutely do that. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Carlene. I just wanna not surprisingly <clears throat> second what Liz just said, and also add that um, I think that the Health Policy Commission could have, um, could be helpful to the community health improvement plan and community health needs assessment processes that hospitals go through if this is done well and right, because that's something that um, all of the hospitals need to engage in. And um, having a, how do I say this? Having a common way of understanding how health system factors play into health inequities and health disparities can help in having some more consistency across community health needs assessments and across community health improvement plans in ways that could be really helpful if this is done in some in a way that is accessible to those processes. Great, thank you, very helpful. And apologies, Carlene Pavlos, Massachusetts Public Health Association. Really happy to be here. Finally, um, Dr. Dunlap. 
Hi, I'm, I'm Ronald Dunlap, uh, past president of the Massachusetts Medical Society, representing the Medical Society, a semi-retired cardiologist, uh, having worked in uh, multiple Boston hospitals, teaching and, and practice, and uh, currently serving on multiple community uh, nonprofit boards. But my interest is uh, in the fact that we have so many people in Massachusetts studying healthcare disparities, but the, the the corrective actions which need to be defined based on the data are really not uh, in, in large part taking place. I, I really think that this has to be the beginning of changes in the system and that's really what matters. We have so many experts, but and they can they can you know talk chapter and verse on what's wrong and define the disparities, but fixing the the, the deficits is really something that we should focus on. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Dunlap. And I think part of this work will be solutions oriented too. So I think a lot of folks will be interested in seeing that. Um, all right. Any other questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. I have one more slide before I turn it back over to Director Seltz. And finally, <laughs> we're excited to share that the 10th annual Cost Trends hearing is happening on November 2nd. And it will be open in person uh, to attendees for the first time in two years which is very, very exciting. The theme of the 2022 hearing is um, 10 years of cost containment in Massachusetts, charting the path to affordability for the next decade. Uh, so that's the theme, not a small theme. Uh, we are back at Suffolk Law School. We look forward to seeing many of you there. Registration for the event is open. Um, the link is right here on the slide for you to sign up. We are gonna be capping in-person attendees to allow for a safe event. And of course, we're, requir we're requiring COVID attestation, COVID vaccination attestation at the time of registration. Um, but we are always happy to offer priority registration and seating to our advisory council members who wish to attend. So please sign up uh, at the registration link here. It's gonna be uh, one day starting at 12 p.m., about 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. And I'm just, I'm also thrilled to share that Governor Baker will be joining us um, live in person and Attorney General Healy will be providing remarks again again this year. So very exciting. We'll be releasing an agenda in the coming weeks and some of your organizations will be called to testify if not already, so look out for that. Um, and then one final item relative to the hearing is that requests for written uh, pre-file testimony were sent to 28 payers and provider organizations this year. All of the organizations and all of the questions are posted on our website now. And as the responses come in, they'll also be posted to the website so you can see how everyone responds. If you haven't received it yet, I have good news for you. You are off the hook for this year. We don't do everybody that we are that we are um, able to. So you're off the hook if you didn't receive it this year. But if you did receive it, it's due back Monday, October 24th. And we look forward to hearing from you. Anyone has any questions on the hearing or the pre-file testimony, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, and I'm happy to help. All right, Director Seltz, back to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Colleen. Um, so uh, switching gears and topics into our main discussion item, um, wanting to uh, review some of the key findings from our cost trends report. So on the next slide, um, you can see this is the kind of outline or table of contents of this year's report. As always with this report, we have um, some standard uh, analyses that we run every year in terms of understanding uh, spending vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark, what are the categories that are driving spending. Um, this year, we did a deeper dive um, on a topic in, on ambulatory care during the COVID-19 pandemic, and so have a pretty uh, lengthy analysis uh, that we conducted about how um, changes in, in care shifted uh, during 2020. Um, as always, we have a set of uh, policy recommendations, which I'll walk through uh, shortly. Um, and then finally, the policy, the report does include a board of HPC performance metrics. I just want to mention the dashboard. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's at the end of the report. And here we take a number of, of kind of performance metrics in categories like access, like affordability, like health equity. And we kind of track our progress year over year. And so we'll do kind of a green light, yellow light, red light, uh, color coding to say, are we improving on these metrics? Are we, um, is our per performance declining on these metrics? And also the, then we compare our Massachusetts performance to national performance where there are comparable metrics. And so um, it is a great uh, kind of summary. And I know 
um, there is great interest in understanding and making sure that we're tracking uh, metrics beyond just uh, the benchmark. And so that is a great place to find a lot of that. Um, also, we have uh, a chart pack, uh, which includes um, uh, updated slides on common areas that we do every year, price trends, hospital utilization, post-acute care. Um, and those are uh, can be easily um, kind of picked up and, and those slides can be repurposed for your purposes. Um, before we dive into this year's cost trends report, though, I do actually just want to kind of return to the presentation that Colleen just gave in terms of all of the other very ambitious research topics uh, that we are currently tackling. And, you know, I, I, I looked through those research topics, you know, ED boarding, health disparities, you know, issues of, of ambulance and, and transport, the impact of COVID-19 on our healthcare workforce, you know, the use of telehealth. These are all really critically important topics and issues um, that are, are really just timely um, for policy conversations. And so just want to reiterate and amplify what Colleen said, that we hope to, uh, make, you know, have those reports be impactful, um, but also we want your per input on them as well. And so if, if you know, we will reach out to you, you can reach out to us um, on all of those really important topics, because those, those are really top of mind for so many organizations these days. Um, so returning to this year's cost trends report, um, uh, primarily a lot of our data was from 2020 and 2021. Um, and so the impact of COVID-19 on spending and utilization trends was very top of mind for this report as well. On the next slide, just very briefly, um, we did uh, include online an interactive version of our uh, chart pack and key findings, um, as well as our recommendations. Um, and it just provides another mechanism um, for people and the public to, um, you know, really dive deep into our findings and our data uh, at the level that is most uh, helpful to you. And also, uh, this was laid out in a way that you can view this and manipulate all of the data and graphs on your phone. Uh, so if you're ever bored or waiting in line somewhere, just pull up the 2022 cost trends report and you will find something interesting. I guarantee it. So um, what I wanted to do to before we jumped into the policy recommendations, I do think it's important to just lay out some of the key findings that we identified in this year's report. And so for those of you who did happen to view our board meeting last week, this will be a little bit of a, a repeat presentation. For those of you who weren't able to uh, view the board meeting last week, this will be new. But I'm going to ask David Auerbach, who is our policy director on our research and cost trends team, to provide a flyover of the greatest hits in terms of some of the key findings in this year's report. Uh, so David, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, 10 minute flyover. Thank you, David. Um, here, are some of the, here are some of the key highlights and just a few bullet points. And then most of these will be on uh, in, in about uh, one of the next 10 or so slides is the total that I'll, that I'll be showing. Um, so to state these, while well, total spending declined in 2020, as we know, the benchmark, we were negative 2.4. Um, reductions in use of care were larger than that, but they were offset by price increases. So it would have been, it would have been uh, more of a reduction. One category of care, uh, unlike most of the others that actually had increased use in 2020 was psychotherapy visits. And we'll show a slide on this. And the vast majority of those were delivered by telehealth, which is, which is a persistent change that we see. Um, commercial spending growth in Massachusetts, you'll see, is no longer below the U.S. rate. We had been below for quite some time. Um, of the price increases that we tracked, they were largest in the hospital setting and for prescription drugs. And we did a deep dive on hospital outpatient prices, and we found those prices varied more than two to one across hospitals. We created a new index that I will show, and that price variation across hospitals grew from 2018 to 2020. Okay, so let's move on with the flyover. This slide is showing by major market segment, how did spending per enrollee change? So you see it's all negative in the blue there. The commercial drop was smaller than in the other categories of care, again, because price increases were higher in commercial than in the other categories. And you see some enrollment shifts that are also important. Enrollment shifted away from commercial towards mass health. 
and away from Medicare fee for service into Medicare Advantage. Next slide. Here's what I was showing with our commercial trend uh, converging towards the US. We were, our commercial spending growth was quite a bit below the US rate in 2013. And you can just see that that gap has gotten smaller and smaller to the point where in 2020, um, we actually, our, our spending growth was, decline was not as large as in the US. So spending grew faster. Okay. And when we looked at spending by major category of spend, and this is just the commercial market, um, you can see that the almost that all areas declined in 2020 except for pharmacy on the right. Pharmacy spending grew 8.6% in total. And the biggest declines were in professional spending, which is in the light blue. There wasn't as much of a decline in facility, um, which is mostly hospital spending. Okay. And here, this is one of the few slides where we are tracking this trend. We have data all the way up until 2022. And this is total ED visits by category. And you can see before the pandemic in 2019, we are really, ED visits are lower than they were before the pandemic. They have not gone back up to pre-pandemic levels yet. Um, and the drops were biggest among potentially avoidable ED visits, but all the other categories are also down from where they were before the pandemic. And this is also true with inpatient visits, which we're not showing in this, but we will have more detailed information on ED and inpatient uh, before the, at the cost trends hearing. Next slide. Um, and this is a slide tracking also through the end of 2021, ED boarding, which we'll be doing additional reports on as, as we've shown. And this is a helpful slide where we're breaking down behavioral health ED boarding into mental health on the top in the blue and substance abuse, substance use disorders in the yellow. And really the growth in ED boarding is all coming from mental health uh, ED visits, which almost half end up in the ED for at least 12 hours. That's what that is showing by the end of 2021. Next slide. Here is detail on what I mentioned with the increase in psychotherapy visits in 2020. This is showing just a quarterly view uh, for the four quarters of 2020, and it's broken into different age groups. But you see the increase occurred among all age groups. And with this major change of, whereas before the pandemic, the vast majority of visits took place in person. And after the pandemic, the orange is most of that bar, meaning that more than 85% more than of visits were delivered via telehealth. And all signs and data that we have suggest that this is this is not changed. This is the way these visits are being delivered today. And it's really one of the major changes that we saw uh, in the pandemic. And that increase again is really is really unusual. And whether it was because of greater access because of telehealth or an increase in in you know mental health and stress problems in the population, it's probably some of both. Okay, next slide. Um, now a few slides getting into some of the price work um, here as we're showing price increases. And this is total spending per encounter in these different settings. And that growth was about 4% in hospital outpatient and in hospital inpatient settings. Price growth was a little smaller in office settings in 2020, the yellow. Okay. Um, we also saw price growth in the average spending per branded prescription. In 2020, um, that grew about 11%, and you can see uh, the wide distribution in spending. The 95th percentile of those branded prescriptions were almost $5,000, um, so 5% priced more than that in 2020. Next slide. And we see continued increases in out-of-pocket spending. Here we're highlighting several major categories of, of chronic conditions where people are using a high proportion of branded drugs and that out-of-pocket spending for 30 days of these drugs grew about 50 to 60% over the last three years. Next slide. This is a trend showing trends in inpatient, coded inpatient acuity. And this is a really important slide. Um, we have found over the years that about half of the increase in commercial spending on inpatient stays is coming from acuity increases and the other half is coming from pure price increases. And other work that we have done has also found that those acuity increases are mostly about changes in coding practices, not in 
differences in the underlying health of the patients. And here, those trends continued from 2013 into 2020 and 2021, pretty much the same rate of trend, the same, the same overall pattern of just increasing coded acuity. Um, and we will also have some updated slides on this again in the cost trends hearing. Next slide. And here we have a couple slides on a on a new a new tool we created to compare the prices of hospital outpatient services across hospitals uh, in the state. We're able to aggregate prices by creating a market basket index where we took the 50 highest spend items provided in hospital outpatient departments statewide and said, what would, what would the price be for this basket of the same 50 things, mammographies, colonoscopies, MRIs, and so on? If we went to every single hospital, how much would it cost for the same basket of things, just like you would uh, for a grocery store basket? Um, and here you can see the difference in how much that would cost. And that variation is more than two to one, and this is 2020. And having this basket also allows us to compare overall price growth over time. And we can also compare prices uh, by different payers or really any way we wanna cut this data. And so this has been a helpful tool. And in addition to this variation, the next slide shows that um, we looked at by hospital system variation in the cost of the basket along the x-axis and growth in the cost of the basket on the y-axis. And the fact that there's a, sort of a general upward pattern uh, is telling us that price variation grew over this period of 2018 to 2020, that the places with the higher prices also had higher growth in prices in general, not for everyone. But that was, a, that was an important finding. Okay. And then Last, we in our front section, we usually talk about what does this all mean for affordability? And this is one new way of depicting that that we came up with where we took a, a family of four with income between three and five times the federal poverty level in 2020 and compiled some other data on what, what does it typically cost for food, for housing, for childcare, whether you live in the Boston area, the Worcester area, and so on. It added what we know about healthcare spending to that spending tally. And we found even surprising to us that a family like this in the Boston area had expenditures, and this is not even counting, you know, discretionary spending, emergencies, this is just your basic expenditures that are about 1500 over what your income would be in a typical month, where you're, you're really just extremely challenged in basic cost of living and affordability. And the healthcare contribution to that is, is significant. That's the, the top of that bar, the orange and the blue. Um, a little more affordable, the Worcester area, but still a family like this would be pretty stretched. And this is, you know, this is uh, consistent with everything that we know and putting it all together was, was still eye-opening to us. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's some of the highlights and I'll turn that back to you, David. Uh before we move into the, the policy recommendations, do you want to just pause to see if there's any questions or reactions to any of the, the data uh, findings that David just walked through? Um, all right. Well, hearing, hearing none at this point, and feel free to return to those we uh, continue this conversation. Did want to shift gears now to our our overall conclusion and policy recommendations in this report. And I think, as has been noted, I think many times this was a milestone year for the Health Policy Commission. This is the ten year anniversary of the passage of Chapter Two Twenty Four, and the beginning of this journey um, on healthcare cost containment in the Commonwealth. And so, as we prepare our conclusion and policy recommendations. We did so um, with that in mind, that we really have now 10 years of experience, 10 years of data, 10 years of lessons learned, and 10 years of a, an even greater understanding of the dynamics and drivers of, of our healthcare system um, than, than just about any other state, uh, truly. Uh, and so this is an incredible resource that we've built up over time, uh, and also an opportunity to reflect on what we know to help us inform where we go next. And so we really tried to frame our conclusion and policy recommendations around this concept of what, what have we learned and what is our path forward to advance 
our goals of cost containment, affordability, and health equity. And in reflecting on the 10 years, we did note and see that we had made um, notable progress in moderating the growth in healthcare spending, especially um, in the first set of years after the passage of this law. Uh, but however, in the most recent years, um, we as a state were exceeding the healthcare cost growth benchmark and did exceed the benchmark in 2019, the year before the pandemic, you know, before, uh, you know, the, you know, any inflationary headwinds, uh, before any impacts of COVID, we were already exceeding the benchmark. And um, we try to identify um, based on the data and evidence, what are some of these persistent challenges um, that we can observe uh, over the past 10 years? And so we wrote them up uh, here, and I'll just um, briefly uh, summarize um, some of these persistent challenges. Of course, we reflect on the fact that there have been, that price continues to be a driver of overall healthcare spending, both in the provider and pharmaceutical space. And, and just as importantly, that there is extensive variation in those pricing that is unrelated to value. We continue to see increased market consolidation and shift in uh, patient volume to higher cost settings and sites of care. Uh, as I mentioned, we continue to see and have shown in the data that pharmaceutical pricing uh, increases um, and has related increases on out-of-pocket cost sharing for patients. Similarly, we've seen um, even, even in uh, years where uh, total spending has decreased, uh, nonetheless, premiums continue to steadily increase. Um, uh, and also that there continues to be shifts of the cost of care onto businesses and consumers and into, onto consumers in particular in the role of high deductible health plans. We note that one of the strategies um, that was key to Chapter 224, um, the adoption of alternative payment mechanisms that would reward providers for providing uh, quality care, cost-effective care, uh, that in the commercial market, these um, value-based contracts have uh, generally stalled. And for the most part, our contracts continue to be on a fee-for-service uh, chassis, uh, even within those innovative contracts. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, prevalent throughout all of these is the systemic and persistent disparities across a number of factors, of course, race and ethnicity, income, geography, uh, et cetera. So seeing these um, intractable challenges um, we uh, put together uh, a set of policy recommendations that we think can help us uh, address these challenges and move Massachusetts forward um, for the next decade. So on the next slide, um, we wanted to identify some areas for um, recommendations for immediate state action. Um, before I, I walk through these, though, I, I do want to just note that there's another important contextual piece to uh, the release of this report, uh, unrelated to the 10-year anniversary, which is, of course, the impact of COVID-19 and the context of the uh, incredible um, stress that our healthcare system has been through and disruption uh, over the past two and a half years. This context, as we know, has led to um, <laughs> incredible, has exacerbated many of the challenges that I would just walk through on the previous slide and has contributed, you know, real uh, headwinds in the form of inflationary labor and supply costs, which must be taken to, into account uh, as we think about charting a path forward. I would note that other states who have adopted uh, healthcare cost growth benchmarks um, continue to um, uh, innovate and evolve their strategies as well. Uh, and many states have now moved beyond uh, what is included in Chapter 224 in terms of policy levers and tools to address and to moderate healthcare spending growth. And so many of our recommendations would uh, 
uh, put us back into a leadership position among states um, uh, re really wrestling with affordability um, in, in state health policy. So the areas that we recommended for immediate action are to strengthen the performance improvement plan process. This is, again, our primary mechanism for holding entities accountable to uh, excessive spending growth. Um, we note in particular that the metrics used by CHIA um, to identify and refer organizations to the HPC are um, uh, limited by law. Uh, and we recommend that there should be greater flexibility in order in particular to identify uh, and to take into account the underlying variation in provider um, pricing, at baseline spending and market position. To be able to have a more nuanced application of the benchmark that takes into account the underlying differences of, of provider organizations and health plans. The second area for um, prioritized action was in um, constraining what we know to be the major driver of, driver of healthcare spending, uh, pricing. And so here too, we recommend action to address excessive price growth, uh, both for healthcare services and for pharmaceuticals, um, and a number of complementary policy recommendations, such as limiting hospital facility fees, expanding oversight of the pharmaceutical sector, uh, and enhancing scrutiny of uh, consolidations. And then finally, uh, we recommend action to ensure that uh, if we're able to moderate healthcare spending growth uh, through these first two policy uh, strategies, that those savings are passed on to consumers in the form of lower premiums uh, and cost sharing. And so here we recommend action to uh, strengthen the health insurance review process uh, in order to provide greater oversight and transparency such that any of these savings are truly passed uh, on to consumers and that we're setting clear affordability standards for uh, health plans and uh, as part of that rate review process. We th think of these three things as being um, uh, part of a whole, uh, that each work together to help um, uh, advance the overall goal of trying to moderate healthcare spending growth and promote affordability. And so really do think of them as a package, not as individual pieces on their own. Um, this is, uh, we have many other recommendations in our policy report. Uh, which are uh, uh, summarized on the next few slides. I I'll just highlight a couple of areas that aren't reflected on this slide, um, just so the advisory council can get a full set of some of the topics that um, we think should be addressed. So on the next slide, um, uh, these the first two recommendations were around strengthening the benchmark and constraining excessive price and addressing price variation in particular. Uh, I just already had uh, talked through these so we can move on past this slide. Um, here too, I, I uh, mentioned these recommendations on oversight of pharmaceutical spending and making health plans accountable for affordability. Um, I don't think there's much more to say on, on these ones. On the next slide, however, there are, here are some areas that are included in our recommendations that I did wanna highlight as well. Uh, our recommendation number five, um, which is advancing health equity for all. Um, we have another number of sub recommendations here about setting common health equity improvement targets uh, to uh, comments that were made earlier, um, you know, trying to really track and measure how are we making progress? How are we making, so, you know, what are the solutions that we're putting in place on this issue? Improvements in data collection, using payer provider contracts to advance health equity. We have a number of, of sub recommendations in the report in this area. And then finally, in our recommendation six, um, did want to highlight that we do have some sub recommendations on improving, or I should say, uh, increasing investment in primary care and behavioral health care in particular. Um, as well as efforts to address um, uh, coding and uh, reduce low value care. Uh, so a, a lot of topics uh, included in these recommendations. Um, Hannah, if we can just go back to the, the prioritized areas um, for action. So I'll, I will pause here. Um, you know, these are 
recommendations that were approved unanimously by the HPC board. We do expect that these recommendations will continue to be a topic of conversation at the um, upcoming cost trends hearing and next year as we um, have a new administration and a new legislature uh, looking to uh, advance and evolve our healthcare strategy. So with that though, I would love to open up the conversation um, to hear from this advisory council on your perspectives on um, either the, the, pers you know, the persistent challenges that we've identified, or I think of even more value, what are the recommendations and solutions that most resonate with you uh, among some of the ideas and strategies that we've laid out here? And I see that we have um, our, our first uh, hand raised, so I will turn it right over to Laura. Um, thanks, David, um, and good to see everyone. Um, I want to thank you for um, obviously this great analysis and thank you um, for noting that in these three recommendations that they are linked and one of them cannot really stand alone, um, particularly around an affordability standard. Uh, the health plans would need the tools uh, to be able to rein in prices, so I appreciate your comments there. You know, I continue to be um, vexed by um, the prescription drug issues and the pricing there. And I know you guys have done a lot of work and I know the legislature has looked at uh, various pieces of legislation with um, a bill passing the Senate. Um, wondering, I guess, for you guys, how will next session be different for the HPC? It seems like we know uh, the underlying uh, cost drivers in our market. Um, I think some of these recommendations are similar to last year. How will next session be different in your mind to actually move some of this um, across the field? Um, well, you're, you're right to note that uh, some of these recommendations are, are similar to past year's recommendations. I would note that many of these recommendations also aligned with uh, proposals that were um, advanced last year by uh, at least one branch of the legislature and were also included in Governor Baker's uh, comprehensive health care reform law. So um, there has been activity and interest across uh, all three branches on addressing um, pharmaceutical um, the pharmaceutical industry and sector. And by that, I, I don't mean just manufacturers. Of course, I think of pharmacy benefit managers as an important part of this conversation as well. And so um, the, the data and evidence that we have, Laura, continues to demonstrate that this was going to continue to be an issue moving into the future. Uh, we know the innovation pipeline um, and that there will be many new drugs, um, new biosimilars, uh, new uh, innovative therapies uh, coming down the pipeline, which will only um, continue to add to uh, real affordability challenges for patients and for our overall cost containment strategy. So I, I continue to think that this is an area that um, is crying out for, for action. Um, and many, many other states have uh, advanced state policies to um, enhance the transparency and understanding of a pharmaceutical pricing and value. And so I think there's a lot to learn from those states as well. Um, thanks. And again, you know, we remain, uh, remain very committed to the affordability agenda. Um, you know, we are concerned about some of the pressures right now the health plans are seeing um, with providers and others and um, needing, uh, looking for additional rate increases, but we're acutely aware of what small businesses and individuals in our state are going through, particularly in, in these inflationary times. So we look forward to working with you closely in partnership. Thanks, Laura. Lisa. Oh. Hi, Lisa Gregoni from Mystic Valley Elder Services. I was just, um, I was appreciate the advanced health equity for all, um, as you can imagine, <laughs> component. I just wanted to mention that I feel like HHS um, and MassHealth have really invested a lot with the ACOs and the community partners um, and the community-based organizations. And certainly from my lens, there's so much good work happening at the very grassroots local level as some of these organizations. I feel like it's important um, for the policy commission to think about including that kind of language also in your investments to the private market, because I feel like a lot of these social determinants can't really be addressed if we don't engage those community partners. That's a great note. Thank, thank you, Lisa. And I, you know, I would um, 
use that opportunity just to mention that while we we have health equity as its own kind of standalone recommendation, if you if you read through our recommendations, I, I hope you will see that we have interwoven um, that theme throughout each one of these. And um, even on this slide here, um, we think that addressing these issues can help advance health equity and um, reduce disparities. But Lisa, to your point, um, how do we ensure that we're, we're getting that information from kind of all levels of the continuum and, and look forward to that? And would also just highlight um, as good a point of any to congratulate the General Commonwealth and, and Secretary Sutters for the recent approval of the Medicaid waiver, which is just um, absolutely huge um, for our, our state. Um, an incredible investment and an incredible investment in health equity in particular. Uh, Chris? Thanks, Dave. Um, hello, everyone. And um, again, really terrific piece of work. Um, it's nice to see all the different aspects from cost to, you know, health equity included. I love what Laura said about, you know, really the, the partnership of providers and insurers. Um, you know, Speaking on behalf of all hospitals, what I can tell you is that we really have to work together on this target uh, of spending because I can tell you um, from doing this a very, very long time, and in my place, we call, uh, we do things on what they call a Schuster string, uh, <laughs> no pun intended. And, you know, with that, the labor costs are really out of control and something that uh, is really very difficult for us to manage if we're gonna be able to address the demand that each of our hospitals is facing. What makes it even harder around cost is, it's very difficult to get patients out of the hospital right now because uh, SNPs and home care are equally suffering and do not have the capacity that they had to take patients. So very often we have a length of stay creep, which is cost creep in my mind, uh, because we're not able to discharge patients to the appropriate uh, care settings when we need to. Uh, the supply cost and the inflationary costs are, you know, often as much as 17% higher than what we were paying in 2019. And so having to, to build that in, and it's consistent with what you're seeing across the country. All you have to do is read Becker's or Fierce Healthcare, and you see the, the, uh, reductions in force and the closing of programs and services. So uh, we wanna work really closely with you on that. It's a very uh, challenging time because of the things we don't control, like the labor cost, the traveler cost and all those. At the same time, I think we're beginning to see in spades how patients weren't able to get the healthcare that they need for the uh, past, two years. As a result, they're coming into hospitals sicker than they ever were before. And, you know, we really are watching uh, the medical complexity increase. And, uh, you know, my favorite topic, which I've written about extensively is the mental health crisis. I can tell you on any given day, prior to two years ago, I would have two, maybe three patients in a community emergency department on hold for mental health. I've had as many as 17 patients in an ED that, that has about 33 beds and it's not the right place. Everyone is working on this, but it does add to our costs because we have sitter costs that are involved to keep these patients safe, as well as additional uh, psychiatric staff to come in to help us care for these patients. So we really wanna work with you, but the challenges are very big. Thanks for listening. Uh, Chris, and, and um, I, I agree with all of your sentiments and appreciate, um, thank you for, for sharing the real pressures uh, that you're under. And I know, you know, I think are reflective of, of many provider organizations, many hospitals are under these pressures. And, you know, I, I guess we'll use this opportunity to note that, you know, as we think about the healthcare cost growth benchmark and accountability to these goals and targets during this time period, um, we've built into this process that as part of our review of organizations that have that are referred to us and that have spending above the benchmark, um, we have to take into account things that are, were outside of their control. 
And so I think that factor, as you said, uh, some of the, the drivers of your internal you know, operating costs that have been outside of your control, both from kind of uh, you know, a macroeconomic perspective, but also from the health and utilization of the patients that are arriving um, th to the ability to be able to timely transfer patients to other health settings of care. Um, we will be reflecting on all of those dynamics as we think about accountability, because this context is really important. And we want to ensure that we're not um, holding people accountable to things that were truly outside of their control. And so that will be, I think, an important part of how we think about how do we apply, how do we think about a, a benchmark, which is not a cap, um, is a goal, is a target in the context of of dynamics that may be outside of the control of individual systems and health plans. Um, uh, my next hand I see is Carlene. Thank you, David, and like thanks to all of HPC. That was a really impressive data presentation. It's really compelling data. I'm still like mulling over some of it in the back of my head. And I may send you all questions about some, what some of the slides actually mean after I, cause it took me a while to understand what they said. And now I'm trying to figure out what the implications and meaning of some of that is. It was but, quick. We did it quick. Yeah, it was fast, but I should have read the, the slides in advance. Sorry, Colleen. Um, the, I really appreciate the recommendations. I mean, I think that they're um, strong and they follow the data, which is really nice to see that you actually built your recommendations off the data. Um, I, of course, am smitten with recommendation number five, um, the advanced health equity for all. Um, and I, I really do appreciate that because while the healthcare system cannot create health equity. It has, it, because equity is not, you know, create the health equity isn't going to be solved by the healthcare system. It, the healthcare system has a role in this. And I really appreciate the recognition of that. The three, the four strategies that you have there. I do hope that the um, strategy to address social determinants of health and that the health care systems role in that really does mean the social determinants of health. And it's about some of the policy changes that need to happen there to shift the social determinants of health and not just health related social needs, which I also think is, that is also a hugely important thing for the healthcare sector to be engaged in. But the, um, the power and voice and, um, moral authority of the health system in the social determinants of health policy space is also really needed in this state. And I hope that the recommendation is, is envisioning that kind of role. And I just have um, one other comment on that, which is that you mentioned that all stake stakeholders should have a role in this. And I hope that the Health Policy Commission finds some ways to align with the health equity compact. I noticed, I think Michael's gone. I don't think he's on the call anymore, but um, I think that there could be some alignment between the health equity compact work that's being done and this recommendation. And I hope you find ways to build that synergy. Um, thank you, Caroline. Thank you for the, the compliments. And yes, please pester us with questions uh, as you, as you dive deeper into this and uh, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was about to give that same shout out to the Health Equity Compact and to, to Michael Curry uh, and Jeff Sanchez and others who are leading that work. And um, we have been engaged in, in conversations with them and do think that that um, is an incredible opportunity thinking about next year and, and kind of harnessing um, all of this incredible commitment and energy, but harnessing it for action. And that's that's what I'm, I'm most excited about. Um, Ron? Uh, thank you for the impressive uh, presentation of data and analysis. Uh, one of my concerns in terms of health equity is that given that telehealth is playing such an important role, I think it would be helpful to analyze the um, breakdown of the patients in terms of uh, socioeconomic groups and age and so forth, because I think there are significant deficits in those areas, and therefore those patients really have poor access, which obviously therefore 
results in them not having equitable health care. So I think that the data as a as a rule as a whole shows a, a trend. But I think if you look at these subgroups, you'll find that there's a paucity of data and access for those groups. So I think it'd be really important to to analyze subgroups if you can get that data in the future. Um, thanks, Ron. And maybe just very briefly, David Auerbach, maybe you can mention some of the different variables that we've been able to isolate in the telehealth work, which we'll be um, uh, we'll be previewing next week, actually. Yeah, yeah. I hope you're able to tune into that because we were able to to observe a lot about even just the, the income of your of your zip code, and we are, are able to see that your health status, um, your your provider, how rural or urban. Uh, where you live is and a few other things. And we do see some really interesting results uh, based on those breakdowns. Um, Cheryl, great to see you. Really great to see you. And thank you so much for the data presentation. And just every time that I see um, uh, and come to this meeting, I learn uh, something new. And I, I also have a point that is uh, very similar to the point that Carlene made and a question regarding healthcare um, and equity for all, um, that point number five, health equity and not healthcare equity. Because I do think that it's an important distinction, right? That, um, that it isn't just about health-related social needs. It really is about these upstream factors. And you know the data that David presented was really powerful, just showing some of the headwinds that um, communities and patients face economically. And I, the question that I have is, within the recommendations, how much of the uh, recommendation kind of pushes forward this idea that there really does need to be uh, multi-sectoral and sort of trans-sector work around uh, health equity. Um, I was also very um, um, touched by Dr. Dunlap's comments about sort of recognizing the problem and then how do we move it towards solution. Um, at some point, somebody has to try to own this issue um, around these sort of transsexual partners, uh, transsectoral partnerships that need to be put together. And uh, I just think it's an opportunity to put that formally in recommendations. Just curious to know how you're uh, thinking about it and whether any of that uh, might um, be recommended in the report. Um, thank you, Dr. Clark. Um, I, I, I would um, offer that I, I think we definitely tried to, in this recommendation in particular, highlight the need for um, coordination and collaboration across sectors uh, with within the healthcare system, beyond the healthcare system, you know, thinking about not just, you know, kind of state government agencies, but local and municipal agencies. So I think we try to really capture that need for this to be you know, it's bigger than the health policy commission, right? Like this is this is bigger than any kind of one, you know, government agency to take on or, or one hospital or one health system or one health plan. Um, and so I think we try to kind of in, embrace that, the need for that type of um, cross-sector collaboration and to, and also to, to set goals, to, to have clear measurable goals that then everyone is working towards and can see what the progress is and have common solutions. So, um, I'll, I'll send you the text, uh, Dr. Clark, and you you give me red note edits, and I, I will happily accept them. But I think we we tried to um, incorporate that that ethos. Um, thank you, uh, Amy. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, a couple of thoughts. So this is all very helpful. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank you for the provision around. Um, uh, accountability and affordability for people. Uh, as we saw in the years leading up to the pandemic, um, individuals' uh, costs were increasing at a faster rate. We're in this period right now. At some point, we will go back to normal, whatever that will mean at this point. And I do want to try to avoid the scenario again, where we saw those increases for consumers going up at a rate that was faster. So just want to flag that, and, and you know, this is particularly an issue in the individual and small group markets. So, just flagging that. I would also argue that this is a piece of a health equity, the health equity issues that we see. Affordability, we know, is a significant issue um, 
And to Carlene's point and others, I think it's really important that health equity remain front and center. Um, love Cheryl's point about health, health and not just health care. So just want to echo all of that. Um, I do also want to acknowledge the significant workforce issues that we know are going on right now. Um, I, you know, I've been hearing it from hospital friends. We also on our helpline are hearing about it um, every single day around people being unable to see primary care doctors and behavioral health specialists. I will just share this anecdote, which is we're getting calls every week from people who are calling for prenatal care because they tried to get in with a primary care doctor to get birth control and was, were unable to do it and are now in need of primary care. And we're getting those calls every single week. Um, but as we think about workforce and we think about it as it relates to hospitals in particular, I do think that recommendations around price variation are critically important. It's been something we've been talking about in the Commonwealth for a long time. I do think it's something we need to try to really figure out a way of addressing and just wanted to acknowledge um, you all calling that out. So I, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Amy. Thank you for those comments and, and for, for highlighting something that um, I, I, I think is, is, is so apparent in the data that we see, which is the, the intersection between affordability, access, and equity. Um, we, we know from the data that, you know, um, you know, survey data last year indicated that about 47% of Massachusetts adults uh, did not get the care that they needed because of the cost of that care. And those numbers are, are much higher um, for um, respondents who identified as Black, or identified as Hispanic, I think, you know, up to 60 to 70% of respondents. So there are, are real health equity issues that um, are part of affordability challenges that then lead to access problems and worse care, um, worse health outcomes, more medical debt. You know, that is why these things are so interconnected and linked um, because, um, as you know, I think I, I, I showed last year, you know, we have, you know, a, um, a vicious cycle of, you know, increased um, premiums, you know, lack of affordability that then just perpetuates these inequities. So how do we actually change this cycle into a virtuous one? So thank you for those comments. Yeah, um, thank Amy. You. Uh, Dr. Strongwater. Good afternoon. Great session. And a lot of great data. I, I think we all have to recognize and respect the price pressures that hospitals are under right now. Labor costs are real. Drug costs are real. I, I offer th three recommendations um, that I hope would be helpful. Um, one would be to consider setting enrollment targets for value-based care. You mentioned in your conclusion that we have not been able to get as far as we would like we don't know i don't recall if we're reporting on it in the same way that we said network trend cost targets i would i would just offer that perhaps if we focus more on that it might be helpful um in the, in the context of how do you get people to the right site of care i don't know how sophisticated our triage systems are whether those are through ambulance companies or as in other states they've centralized a lot of that triage uh, but that could get people to the right location without uh, overloading our EDs. And then finally, I, again, I've, I've said this perhaps in the past, but regional BH, BH emergency departments could unburden each of the individual hospital EDs that have to staff for behavioral health emergencies and boarding. So three recommendations for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Strongwater. And just to maybe um, one reflection on, on the first one of those around value-based contracting. You know, as, as I mentioned, this was a, a key strategy that was part of the initial um, kind of design of Chapter 224. We actually, in, in the first couple of years, we set improvement targets um, as part of the annual report to say, you know, we'd like to see, you know, the number of covered lives in these types of contracts um, increased by 30% in three years. And we, you know, set those targets, we tracked against it, we did not meet those targets. And so I, I offer that not to say that we shouldn't keep at it, and it's not worthwhile yeah. to keep pushing forward. And I think maybe I'll just put a pin, I think we could have a whole hour and a half section session about 
you know, the the stalled adoption of value-based contracts in the commercial market and what we do about that. Um, so let's maybe just put a pin yeah. in that for a, a longer future conversation. Yeah. Cause I do think, you know, you, you mentioned kind of the, the pressures, you know, that, that, you know, indiv- you know, provider systems are under and, you know, some of those pressures are a reflection of a fee for service system that, right. you know, some of this care has, has moved, you know, has moved to other settings of care. Not all of the elective surgeries that we've seen have come back fully. And so if your revenue base is on built on a fee for service model, that can be, you know, problematic. And so I, I do think there's absolutely a worthy, probably longer conversation. Um, but thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, a few other uh, commenters here, I think, uh, Steve. Thanks, David. And, and thank you for, for the report. And um, just a, a quick mention of the waiver. I appreciate you, you calling that out. But I think for, for those that, that are working passionately and care deeply about health equity, this waiver is the first one in the country uh, to tie equity measures to money. And when you're looking at healthcare, it really is about um, follow the money. And so um, uh, the leadership of Governor Baker, Secretary Sutters, and every single hospital um, in the Commonwealth filing resolution uh, in support of making health equity the centerpiece of this waiver um, is real and it's exciting. Uh, I looked at the slide that, that David Auerbach put up around the, the, the uh, commercial spending nationally, and, and you know it, it, it's plummeted everywhere. It just plummeted a little less here than it did in the U.S., so it's not a necessarily a fair comparison, and it's partly because the payers and providers in this Commonwealth are not willing to let our system fail. We're not willing to not, not meet the needs of our patients and our communities. So I want to comment not on the recommendations, but on the other amazing work I think the HPC is doing. Some of the charges that the legislature has given you around the COVID-19 report, the BH report and the workforce report, those are so timely and so important. And I, 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 I call back to Secretary Sutter's talking about the workforce at the board meeting last week and Commissioner Foley talking about the workforce at the board meeting and Commissioner Cryer talking about care delivery at the board meeting. And those incredibly important things that you're working on and your commissioners are talking about yet don't seem to be re- you're working on and your commissioners are talking about yet don't seem to be reflective in the top three recommendations. And so I would just offer that where I think we really are right now as a Commonwealth um, is we are having significant challenges in our workforce, as Chris has talked about and others have highlighted. We've spent over a billion dollars on travel nurses. Um, We have spared uh, no expense in order to meet the needs of patients as they come through the door. And if any of you have been patients in the last few months, you know how difficult and complicated it is right now to navigate your way through a hospital. It is really hard and it is really complicated and it is really expensive, but our hospitals continue to do that. They also have significant capacity challenges Fiscal stability, as you saw from the latest Chia, is at uh, uh, is at, is about as fragile as it's ever been. Um, and our delivery of care system, some of the things we're really excited about: mobile integrated healthcare, hospital at home, the telemedicine provisions that have talked about, all are set to expire with the expiration of the public health emergency. Um, and and BH boarding is as bad as it has ever been. As as Don is up next, and, and David Wells knows. Um, and so, I'm just a little concerned that those pieces that talk to the incredible fragility of the system as it stands today are not reflected in the recommendations that the commissioners will be looking at as the cost trends hearings approach. Um, And you've, you've said it so eloquently, you've described the challenges, you understand them, your team understands them. I just remain concerned that they're not in there and we're not talking about what the real problems are um, right now going on with our healthcare system around the Commonwealth. So thanks for allowing me a few minutes and look forward to the cost trends and hope some of the the questions and some of the testimony reflect what the real world experiences are right now in our hospitals. Um, Thank you, Steve, and and look forward to working with you and others on uh, all of those other timely reports, uh, as you mentioned. Um, we have uh, a few minutes left. I'd love to hear from from Donna and then Deb. Um, welcome. Thank you. I'll be brief. I did put a comment in the uh, chat that it was a great presentation, very informative. Uh, what comes to mind has been alluded to by others, and I just want to state because the pressures, well, the legitimacy of the cost question is real. The pressures are great. 
as you're looking back over 10 years at what's been accomplished. Uh, it's inevitable that people are going to want to double down to try to meet some targets. But at the same time, as everyone's articulating, we're having this crisis in the workforce that in behavioral health, but in other areas also really go at its roots is related to the underpricing of the services, driving low reimbursement rates, low salaries, which ultimately are not sustainable. And now we're in a real pickle. And at the same time that we have things we want to accomplish in terms of cost containment and price. And so obviously those are trends running against each other. Addressing one problem could drive some costs. So I just think it's important that we're in this with a uh, full acknowledgement of that challenge. Um, thank you. I, I wholeheartedly agree that the, 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 the um, headwinds, the conflicting challenges here, they're, they're absolutely real. I think every organization knows that. Um, I, you know, would, would note um, in the recommendations, we continue to recommend for increased spending in primary care and behavioral health care and think that we can do that underneath a health care cost growth benchmark. Um, Governor Baker um, proposed something along those lines uh, last year. So um, do, do see that as a place for increased investment that will provide real value. Um, Deb. All right, I'll make it very, very quick. Um, so from Lawrence's perspective, we are incredibly thankful about the waiver because without it, we would really not be able to continue our service levels to this vulnerable, socially vulner, vulnerable community. Um, I do want to ask that any recommendations really do consider uh, hospitals like ours um, that are at the lowest end of the, the, you know, the payment level and you know, our goal is we need to have higher than benchmark growth in our rates, not lower. And I would just say that without that, I can assure you that health equity will not be served because without adequate reimbursement for the services that we provide, and you can look at the data, all of the data books are there. We can't continue giving the same services to the people that live in this community that other providers can give to their their um, patients. So I would just ask that any recommendations do really look at it uh, as to where people are in the spectrum of that data, because the future of serving health equity in a true way, truly serving health equity depends on it. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, and, and, and thank you for all that you and your organization do. I, I would um, encourage you to, to read the text of the recommendations. This was one area where we really tried to um, uh, refine our language this year in terms of our recommendations around improving the benchmark. That, that part of that improvement should be embedding a greater accounting of price variation and how we think about accountability. And also within our recommendation around um, restraining um, provider price growth um, that in doing so, there should be greater investment of uh, redistribution of those some of those dollars back to lower priced providers that are providing real value. So in many of the recommendations, you can see, again, this theme of trying to address unwarranted price variation as key to you know, overall cost containment, affordability, but also equity. Um, so we, we're at time. This was, a, as always, a wonderful conversation. Um, I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you at the Cost Trends hearings uh, next month. Um, it would be great to, to see you um, if you're willing and able to join. Um, but before we close the session, I'm going to turn it back over to Chair DeVoe. Chair DeVoe, um, any final reflections in this, your first HPC Advisory Council meeting? Wow, what a meeting. Thank you. I, I just want to comment that um, you've given us a lot to take back and think about and that want to register that I hear loud and clear, as many of you have uh, articulated, that our challenge now is to balance this tremendous pressure on the provider community across the board, all types of um, delivery organizations with the fact 
that we have the same kind of inflationary pressures facing our consumers and employers, and that the balance in that is going to be the key um, for us as we now launch into new activities. So want to reinforce that. Um, we're hearing that you know, loud and clear from you. And that's why this committee is going to be so continue to be so important for us because it's just a great place to air out that balance and your uh, recommendations. So thank you, everyone. I look forward to working with you.